If you would like to tweet about the sermon at all this morning, I welcome you to do that. And this is the hashtag for the series is Meet Jesus. And uh, if you want to tweet a quote or, or something that strikes you, feel free to do that. Our mission as a as church is to help people discover, trust, and follow Jesus. That's our, our mission. And we're looking this fall at the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And the answer is both simple and complex at the same time. It's simple in that the Bible is giving us a very clear and a very compelling picture of who Jesus is, but it's complex in that the answer is very multifaceted. There's all kinds of aspects to who Jesus is, and uh, the Bible's using all kinds of metaphors and all kinds of pictures to tell us and convey who he is, and as a result, all these pictures and all these metaphors add up to give us this glorious and this full portrait of this man, Jesus. And what we're doing in this series is looking at those different aspects of who he is and ultimately what he came to do. So with that in mind, a really uh, important question that we want to ask as part of this series is, what does Jesus offer us? What does Jesus offer us? We started to touch on this a couple weeks ago in the, in the last sermon in the series, and we really want to dig into it this morning, and how we're going to dive in is by looking at uh, a passage where Jesus goes to a wedding. We're going to go to a wedding with Jesus this morning. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we read this scripture together. The uh, scripture will be on the screen. It's also on your handout that you would have received. If you didn't get a handout on your way in, there probably should be some at the back on the chair. So feel free to, uh, to grab one if you would like. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have preserved this story for us to read and to enter into this morning. And I pray that you would speak through your servant now words from you, words that make the gospel clear and compelling and that help us to understand who your Son, Jesus Christ, is, what he came to do, and what he offers us today. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So in this passage, Jesus is showing, sorry, John is showing us, Jesus is in the passage, but John, the author, is showing us Three things. He's showing us what Jesus brings, how Jesus brings it, and how we can receive it. What Jesus brings, 
how he brings it and how we can receive it. What does Jesus bring? You know, what does he have to offer us? Well, John gives us the key to understanding this whole passage in verse 11. This is the key to understanding what the whole passage is about when he says this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. If you read John's Gospel, what you see as you read it is that miracles are not just miracles to John. They are miraculous signs. They uh, are signs revealing who he is, his identity, his glory. In other words, the signs of Jesus were symbols pointing to something else, particularly who Jesus is and what he came to do. And this is the first sign, John tells us, that Jesus ever did. And that's particularly important because the first is always extra significant. I mean, think about it. If you're going to reveal yourself, if you're finally going to make your public appearance, your public debut, the first thing you do, you want that to capture the essence of who you are, the essence of what you're all about, the essence of what you're offering. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this passage, and let's do it by asking the, uh, the who, what, where, when, why type questions about this sign, all right? Let's start with who. Who witnessed the sign? Well, in ancient times, weddings were a really big deal. And the guest list not only included your family and your closest friends, but it included everybody in the village. In fact, it included oftentimes people from nearby villages. It was a, a community event that included everybody, even the people that you weren't so fond of. You know, we get away with this a little bit. Um, you know, you, um, if you've ever put together a guest list for a wedding, you know, you, you have that moment where you're writing and you, you have that person. It's like usually Uncle Fred or somebody, and you go, oh, do we have to invite Uncle Fred? He's a horrible dancer, right? And he just takes over the dance floor. And, uh, and you're just like, oh, do we really? Yes, he's family. We have to invite him. Well, that's kind of how it worked in these days. You invited everybody from the village. Everybody came together. And that means that you got uh, people from all kinds of walks of life, ordinary people, the, the, the men and the women and the children and the poor of the village and the rich of the village, the, the morally upstanding people of the village and also the not so morally upstanding people of the village. Everybody showed up. And this is important because Jesus doesn't reveal himself for the very first time to a group of religious leaders or scholars or scribes, but to common, ordinary folks from all kinds of different walks of life. And the fact that he does that, the fact that his very first sign is with ordinary people means that what Jesus offers, he offers to everyone. What Jesus offers, he offers to everyone. So that's the who. Now what about the where? Where did this sign happen? Well, we've already established that it was a wedding. And this setting is significant for a couple of reasons. And here's why. First of all, a wedding in ancient times was the ultimate occasion of joy. You know, th and this is still very much true today. Think about it. Nobody spends as much money as they do on a wedding. I mean, think about even today how people, I mean, I think, I thought I heard somewhere, I can't remember where, that the average wedding these days is like $30,000, like when it's all said and done. Like $30,000. And that's an average, which means some weddings people don't spend as much. Some people spend way more than that. And all this, all this money and all this time and all this energy goes in to this one day. Uh, Mark, I remember when that, that last week, did you even sleep that last week before Jocelyn and I got married? I mean, all this, all this time and energy, everything, why? Why? Because you want it to be a great day. And you're trying to put on the best party you can put on. 
right? That's, that's what all of this planning and all of the money and all of the, the, the time goes into. You want it to be a great day. And there's food and there's music and there's dancing and there's laughter and there's celebration. You know, it's this total occasion of joy. And the fact that Jesus does his very first sign at a wedding, the ultimate occasion of joy, tells us that he is all about bringing festival joy. Festival joy. I mean, what an occasion to reveal himself. Secondly, we should note with the location that this sign, this this revealing of who he is, it doesn't happen at the temple where you might expect it to happen the center of religious life, you know? You would think that if Jesus wants people to know who he is, that he's God come down from heaven, that he would show up at the temple during worship and he would do something miraculous, you know? Uh, Like raising somebody from the dead or healing somebody, but he doesn't do any of that and he doesn't do it at the temple. He does it at a wedding. And that tells us that the picture that best captures who Jesus is And what he is all about and what he's offering isn't ultimately a religious service. It's a joyous celebration. A joyous celebration. So there's the who, there's the where. Now let's look at the the what. What was the sign? Jesus' mother Mary comes to him with a simple problem. The wine has run out. Now this is a very big deal because you see in Jewish culture, the wedding didn't just last a day. It, the, it lasted a week. It was a week-long banquet. Marg, aren't you glad it was only one day? Yeah. You know? I mean, can you, imagine, can you imagine how much more money and how much more time and how much less sleep <laughs> the family gets if this had to go on for a week? But in Jewish culture, that's how it worked. The wedding banquet was a week long. But this one is only a couple days in. And the wine is run out. The party is about to fall flat. And once the, the wine runs out, you know, the party's over. Because see, in those days, there was only a couple things they served to drink. There was wine and water, and that was it. And water wasn't always, you know, the most hygienic. Uh, it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't always. But wine was, was more reliable to be, to be uh, to cl- clean and healthy. And so... If the wine runs out, the party is over. There's nothing to drink. When Jesus turns the water into wine, he takes a dying party, a party that's about to fall flat, and he brings it back to life. He keeps it going. In verse 8, we're introduced to the master of ceremonies. And... In those days, the master of ceremonies was not so much the kind of social host of the gathering, but the banquet host. Uh, It was the the person's job as the master of ceremonies to make sure that there was enough food being served and there was enough wine being served. And when Jesus turns the water into wine, when there's no wine left, you know what he does? He effectively says, I am the true master of ceremonies the Lord of the feast. That's who I am. I am the true MC of this event. I'm the true host of this event. I'm the true Lord of the the feast. And by making over 100 gallons of wine, over 100 gallons, that's over 400 liters, Jesus provides more wine than these guests are ever going to be able to drink by the time this party's over. By the time it gets to the end of the week, there's still going to be wine left over. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, I have come to bring festival joy. And I have come to bring it in abundance, more than you could ever possibly imagine. But there's something else here, too. The rabbis used to say, without wine, there is no joy. Now that's not, don't misinterpret that. That wasn't to mean that, you know, unless we all get liquored up, we're not going to have a good time. That's not, that, that's not what they were saying. In fact, it was quite disgraceful to be drunk at a public gathering like a, a wedding because everybody in the town was there. What they were saying was that in, in the wine, in the physical tasting, this, the sensory experience of wine, 
in a physical sensation, there was uh, a picture that mirrored the emotional and spiritual sensation of joy. And when you look at the Bible, it's constantly using sensory imagery to describe who God is and what God's kingdom is like and what God's salvation is like. L listen to this from Isaiah. Here's a perfect uh, picture. Isaiah says, In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies, he's speaking about the end of history, will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world, and it will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. Serena read this, uh, this text for us this morning. The cloud of, like, look at this picture. The cloud of gloom, the cloud of death, will one day be replaced by what? By the noise of feasting and dancing and celebrating and laughter. This is a sensory experience. A sensory experience. And in Psalm 34, David says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. You know, he doesn't just want his, his readers to know God is good. He wants them to taste. He invites them to taste. And, you know, and that, friends, there's a difference. See, by turning water into wine, Jesus is saying this. He's saying, what I offer you is powerful sensation. Powerful sensation. Not just some kind of things that you believe about me, but an actual experience of me. To put it another way, Jesus says this, what I offer is a real and tangible experience of joy right now. Not just one day, but right now. That's what he was doing. He was bringing joy to this party. You know, the wedding guests at, uh, would literally, they literally got to taste and see that Jesus was good. They tasted the wine. You know, the, the master of ceremonies says, this is the best stuff yet. This is better than anything we have drank so far. Jesus' wine was the best wine. A host always serves the best stuff first. You know, they always save, save uh, the stuff that's not as good for later. So that as the party goes on during the week, you know, that's kind of what they bring out later on. And this is so important, friends, for a couple reasons. And here's... Here's the first one. Some of you here today may have rejected Christianity in the past for the wrong reasons. For the wrong reasons. See, perhaps you felt that church is drab and dull. And maybe you feel like Christians are drab and dull. Maybe you've met some Christians who are you would describe as joy squashers and not joy bringers. Maybe you've encountered some judgmental Christians or some very legalistic Christians. And if you've rejected Christianity on the basis of those things, you need to realize something. You haven't rejected Jesus. You haven't really rejected Jesus. You know what you've rejected? You've rejected the very things that Jesus himself rejected. The things he came to do away with. Joyless religion. Staunch legalism. Ritual formality. See, that's not what Jesus came to bring. Jesus came to bring festival joy and sensation, a powerful sensation, a powerful experience now of what that joy is. And here, Jesus reveals himself and basically says, I'm the life of the party, and I'm the party of life. I'm the life of the party, and I'm the party of life. If you're not a Christian here this morning, would you open yourself up to the possibility and reality that you may be, what you may have rejected about Christianity and what you may be even right now are rejecting about Christianity is not real Christianity, but a false version of it? Because Jesus is showing us here that the things that you've rejected is not what he came to bring. He came to bring joy into your life, and not just any kind of joy, Abundant joy, the real stuff. And if you are a Christian here this morning, 
When you look at your life, I want to ask you this question. Is it filled with joy? You know, is the festival wine flowing in your life? Not literally, by the way. If it's flowing literally, I think we need to talk, all right? <laughs> but is the, is the joy and the festival wine, is it flowing in your life? Or is your Christian experience, is it drab? Is it dull? Is it not, you know, very exciting? Does it, does it thrill you? Does, it, does Jesus thrill you? Does he still recapture your heart? Do you merely do things out of duty? Or is there a deep joy in your heart when you obey God and do the things that God desires for you to do? He came to bring festival joy. But how does he bring it? How does this sensation of Jesus' festival joy, how does it come? You know, how, how does he bring that into our lives? Well, remember... The turning of water into wine is a sign that's pointing to something else. It's pointing to who Jesus is, and it's, it's pointing us to what he came to do. So let's look at two questions we haven't hit on yet, and that is the, the, the when question and the how question of this miracle to see how he brings this. First of all, when did this happen? Well, why does Jesus, or sorry, why does Mary tell Jesus that the wine has run out? Well, because the wedding banquet was supposed to last all week, right? So what? So what, 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 you know, what if it just lasts a couple days? You know, they run out of wine. Okay, so the wedding goes two days instead of six or seven. What's the big deal? Well, that was a huge deal. A huge deal, and here's why. Uh, author and pastor Timothy Keller points this out about this particular story. He says, this was not a mere breach of etiquette, but a social and psychological catastrophe, particularly in a traditional shame and honor culture. See, in shame and honor cultures, the reputation of the family is everything. It's absolutely everything. It was the obligation of this family, of the bride and the, the, the groom, uh, the groom's family in particular, to provide enough wine to keep the feast going for the entire week. And if this party dies after a couple days, you know what you know what happens here? This is a social disaster and it's an embarrassment that would tarnish the reputation of this family, uh, the entire family, especially this newlywed couple. I mean, the newlywed couple would be starting their new life together with this cloud hanging over them. I mean, nobody... And, and Cana was going to forget about this. This cultural faux pas would have haunted them for the rest of, of their life. People would have been talking about that story. Do you remember so-and-so's wedding? Yeah, when the wine ran out after two days? What a disaster that was. And Mary is asking Jesus to perform this sign at a moment of cultural and social embarrassment. And she's saying, would you intervene and would you spare the humiliation of this family. This is about to go south real fast. Would you fix this? And Jesus' reaction, it confuses us, actually. I don't know if anyone else feels confused, but if you really start to look at this, it's incredibly confusing. Here's why. First of all, he says, Dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Now here's what's confusing about this. You know... Jesus always seems so eager to help any other time. You ever notice that? Anytime somebody comes to Jesus with a problem, that we, you know, we, this person is lame, this person is possessed by demons, this person is dead. <laughs> you know, any, any time there's a problem, Jesus is always so eager to help. But here they say, listen, the wine, Mary says the wine's run out, and Jesus goes, that's not my problem. And what's more is, actually, it seems like he disrespects his mother because the translation that says, dear woman, actually kind of softens it. Translators are a little bit afraid at times. He, bo he basically said, he doesn't go, mom. He actually says, woman, that's not our problem. It's like, what's going on? Is Jesus being disrespectful to his mom, mom here? You know, this is not the, the Jesus we're used to seeing, but actually, no, he's not being disrespectful. 
What's going on is Jesus is bothered by something. He's rattled by something, and the clue is in this, his response when he says, my time has not yet come. Because those two things go together. That's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Other translations say, my hour has not yet come. And every time Jesus in Scripture speaks about his time or his hour, he's speaking about his death. He's talking about the cross. Mary's asking Jesus to spare these newlyweds a rough start in life. And you know what Jesus says? He says, woman, it's, it's not my time to die yet. Well, what's going on here? Jesus is at the ultimate occasion of joy. He's at a wedding. But he, doesn't, he seems to be the only one who's not having a good time. He's distracted. Something's bothering him. He he even provides the wine to keep the party going. He shows himself to be the true master of ceremonies, the true Lord of the feast. But he's distracted. Why isn't he celebrating, as it were, like everybody else seems to be? Why is he so distracted? Well, let me ask you a question. What do single people do when they're at a wedding? Anyone? What do, sing- what do single people tend to do when they're at a wedding? <laughs> Drink. Well, yeah, maybe, yeah. Well, you know what I think many single people tend to do? And I know this because I used to do it. You think about your own wedding. Do you remember back ever being at a wedding when you were still single and you're there with them, but some all of a sudden your mind kind of drifts and you start to think about what will it, what will it be like when I get married one day? And who will it be to? And you just, you know, you tend to, to do that. I remember doing it. I remember, you know, the, and the other stuff that creeps in in that moment is you start to kind of envy the people that aren't getting married because you're not getting married and maybe you don't have anybody to get married to yet. And you're just, you know, at some point in the party you just go, huh. Oh. You know, you tend to think about what's my wedding going to be like one day and who will I be marrying? I think that that's what was going on here with Jesus. You see, in Matthew 2, some of John the Baptist's disciples come to, to Jesus and basically they say, why don't your disciples fast like we do? And Jesus answers them this way. He says, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Jesus calls himself the groom. So who's the bride? Well, in the book of Revelation, John, the same one who wrote the the Gospel of John, has a vision describing the end of uh, human history. And he says that in the new heaven and the new earth, there's this wedding feast going on. And at one point, he sees a vast group of people, and these people are shouting. And here's what they say. It says their shouts were like thunder. Uh, Serena read this for us this morning too. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Jesus Christ is the groom and the church is his bride. Over and over again in the New Testament, it says this, that Christ is the bridegroom and we are his bride. And one day, Jesus is going to return for his bride and there's going to be a wedding to end all weddings. You know, there's going to be uh, a banquet to end all banquets. You know, it's very interesting when, um, do you remember when the Sadducees come to Jesus and they say, you know, um, this, this woman, uh, she got married and then her husband died and then someone else married her and then he died, and then someone else married her, and he died. On the last day, who's she going to be married to? And Jesus says, there's no weddings in 
heaven? Not this, there's no marriage in heaven. Now, that's true and that's not true. Jesus is doing a bit of a play on words there. You see, there is a marriage in heaven. And that, there's a, that's the reason why there's no human marriages in heaven, because there's a wedding feast of Jesus Christ to the people he created and died for. And that's us, the church. The description here is of this wedding, this amazing banquet where there's going to be the finest of aged wines and the choices of meats going to be served. I mean, what a glorious picture. So, if that's the picture of the end of human history, if that's the picture of Jesus' wedding, I mean, what a picture. Why is he not happy about this as he's thinking about it? If he's sitting there thinking about his wedding, why isn't he not, not excited? And the answer is because the only way that that wedding is ever going to happen is if he dies. That's why he says in this moment when his mom comes and says, we need you to fix this. Jesus says, it's not time for me to die yet. He's thinking about his wedding and he's thinking about the fact that the only way that the wine is ever going to flow at his wedding feast is if his blood flows first. That's the only way. Jesus knows that the moment he goes public, the moment he reveals himself, guess what? His march to the cross begins. The moment he finally comes out and begins to show who he is, he knows that the journey to the cross starts and there's no turning back. See, there's only one other time we see Jesus like this. You know that? There's only one other time we see, kind of see him this unsettled and it's in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's... The cross is now before him, and he is sweating blood, Luke says. He's so distressed, and he says, he goes and he prays, and he says, God, please take this cup from me. This cup, what's this cup? It's the cup of God's wrath. It's the cup of the reality of of sin being placed on him. That's what he's facing. You know, and, and Jesus in the garden, he gets a foretaste of the cross, and he staggers. He staggers when he gets a foretaste. And you know what I I think is going on here? I think that sitting there and thinking about his wedding and thinking about his hour coming up, Jesus gets an even gentler foretaste, maybe. A small, just tiny, tiny little sip of that cup that he's going to have to drink from. Edmund Clowney Uh, puts it this way. I love this. This is so powerful. Jesus sat amidst all the joy of the wedding feast, sipping the coming sorrow, so that today you and I, who believe in him, can sit amidst all this world's sorrow, sipping the coming joy. I'm going to read that one more time. Jesus sat amidst all the joy of the wedding feast, sipping the coming sorrow, so that today you and I, who believe in him, can sit amidst all this world's sorrow, sipping the coming joy. Wow. So how did this happen? Well, there's one more clue if we're going to understand how Jesus brings this festival joy into our lives, and it's found in how he does the miracle. John notes that the jars that Jesus used for this miracle were used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Verse 6 And in the law of Moses, there were a number of regulations regarding washing and regarding purification. And these ceremonial laws didn't just have to do with physical hygiene, although that was part of it. But see, the physical hygiene part reflected the spiritual state of human beings. See, God was pure, and God was perfect, and God was holy. And when human beings were stained with sin, and the only way you could have the stain removed was you had to offer a blood sacrifice. You had to take the lamb to the temple. You had to offer the sacrifice. And these jars were the jars that were used for ceremonial washing in preparation for the offering of those blood sacrifices to be made. That's what they were there for. And by using those jars as part of his first miraculous sign, Jesus is saying, I have come to bring festival joy, and I bring it by laying down my life 
my perfect, pure, and holy life to wash away the stain of your sin. The only way that you and I will ever make it to the wedding feast of the Lamb is if we're washed. That's the only way. And you know what? We're stained. And we know we're stained. See, many of us don't like this idea that we're sinners. And you, you, know, you may not even believe you're a sinner. But you know what? You know you are deep down. Let me ask you some questions. Why are you working so hard at your job? Why are you trying so hard to be a good parent? Why are you so concerned about your physical appearance? Why are you so worried about what other people think about you? Why are you so worried uh, and concerned to be right all the time? And why do you struggle so much to apologize when you're wrong? Why do you spend too much time doing ministry, both inside and outside of the church? Because you're stained. I'm stained. And in one way or another, we're trying to get the stains out. We're trying to get the stains out. We're trying to overcome this feeling that there's something wrong with us, that we're not good enough. And you know what? We're not. We're not good enough. And we never will be. We'll never get the stain out, no matter how hard we try. Only in Jesus Christ's shed blood can our stains ever be washed. That's the only way we're ever going to know that we are okay, that we're loved, that we're accepted, and we don't have to work it off. We're made pure and we're made acceptable because of what Jesus has done, because his blood has been shed. And that's how Jesus brings the joy. See, the joy can't come unless he succumbs to the ultimate sorrow. And you'll never understand the good news of the gospel until you understand the bad news and how bad it is how deep the stains go. Are you willing to take yourself as seriously, to, to, to look as deeply into yourself as the Bible calls you to look, to be as honest about it? So how can we receive this joy? How do we get it into our lives? Well, uh, three things. I'm borrowing the first two from uh, Tim Keller, who I quoted from earlier, and then I, I'm going to give you one more. First of all, you got to start, start by admitting you're out. See, Mary goes to Jesus because the wine has run out. You know, there's none left, period. There's none left, period. You can't go to Jesus and say, you know, you can't go to Jesus and say, um, would you top me off? You can't go to Jesus like that. You have to admit that you're out. And many of us at times approach Christianity as if it's something that, just that little extra thing that we're missing in life. You know, I'm just looking for that kind of little extra thing to kind of put me over the, the, the hump, to get me to the top of, of having happiness and joy. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is not something to just top you up. He is the life of the party, period. He is the source of joy, period. And you have to go to him and you have to admit that you're out, that you can't manufacture, you can't manufacture the festival wine. The gospel is not an add-on to your life. It is your life. And to stick with the analogy of the story, you know, what happens so often in life is we're, we're trying to make the festival wine we're trying to manufacture the joy, and we never get time to sit down and enjoy it. And if we ever do sit down and try to enjoy it, guess what we find out? It runs out real fast, long before it ever, it's ever supposed to. So only Jesus Christ can bring festival joy into your life that never runs out. So first of all, you've got to go to him, and you've got to admit, I don't have it. Don't top me up, I'm out, all right? That's the first thing. Secondly, you've got to take the credit. You notice that the groom receives the credit for what Jesus did in the story? Did you catch that? The master of ceremonies pulls the bridegroom aside and says, 
you're brilliant. Everybody else serves the best stuff, and then, you know, then they bring out the, the stuff that's not as good. But you've done the exact opposite. You've, you've got good stuff, and you brought out the best stuff. And that's it. <laughs> Jesus doesn't go, um, excuse me, that was me. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't the bridegroom. He planned poorly. I, I'm the one who's keeping this party going. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't attempt to do it. He is perfectly fine with the fact that the, the groom is getting the credit and his family is getting the credit for what's happened. And you know what? That is a perfect picture of the gospel. Because one day when we stand before God and he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? Why should I let you into the celebration? Why should I let you into the wedding feast? We can say, I've done nothing to deserve entry in. But Jesus told me to receive the credit for everything he's done, to take the credit for everything he's done. Friends, that's it. Jesus Christ gave up his life. He endured the ultimate sorrow on the cross so that you and I could have joy, so that you and I could, could get into the party <laughs> because he's the ultimate MC. He's the ultimate master of ceremony. So, Take credit for what he's done. That's what he's asking you to do. Admit you're out and then take the credit. But lastly, we've got to taste and see. Sorry. Taste and see. There's times when the joy of God doesn't always feel real. Like we know it up here, but it doesn't always feel real. You know, what do we do in those moments? Life is up and it's down, and sometimes there seems to be seasons of joy. Sometimes the joy of Jesus seems elusive. And there's a few ways that um, we can continually taste and see. And I know these might seem just ordinary, but the first one is when we read God's Word on a regular basis, you know what we're doing? We're regularly tasting and seeing because we're constantly feeding our hearts the truth about who Jesus is. We're constantly seeing him as the joy bringer. We're constantly seeing what it cost him to bring us the joy. But if you're never spending time letting God's word speak to you and showing you and revealing who he is, if you're never letting that in, if it's never penetrating your, your mind, it's never going to get to your heart. Prayer is another key way because when we spend time in prayer, guess what? The Holy Spirit starts to make the joy real to our heart. When we start really thinking about who he is and we start thanking him for all he's done and we start giving things over to him, the joy starts to come as we realize who he is and that we can leave things with him. Even the small things. Mary comes to Jesus with what seems like a small problem and he's prepared to do something about it. He sees all the small little things in your life, too, in my life. You can trust him with him. But here's another key one, fellowship. You need to get with other people. You need to get with other Christians and spend time with them because, you know what? The festival joy rubs off. When we get together, the joy of the Lord is present. But and lastly, and this is where we're going with all this, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper allows us to literally taste and see. You know that? What Jesus has given us here in this meal is a chance to have our senses stimulated in the taste of bread and in the taste of juice. And it's a picture. This is a picture. This is a foretaste. Do you know that? This is a foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And every time we come to this table, we're tasting to see that the grace of Jesus is good. Is the festival joy flowing in your life? Go to him. He's the master of the banquet, the true Lord of the feast. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now realizing that what you offer us here, oh man, it sounds so good. And we all want it. We all want joy. And we tend to look everywhere else for it, except for the only place we can really find it. And that's in your Son, the Lamb of God, the true Master of Ceremonies, the Master of the Feast, the Lord of the Feast. 
And I pray, God, that for the person here today who maybe needs a renewed sense of that joy, that through participating in this meal of the Lord's Supper, that they would truly taste and see that you are good. And for the person who's never tasted that joy yet, I pray that they would see that it can only come in your Son and that they would open their hearts to him today to admit they're out, to take the credit, and to taste and see that you indeed, Jesus, are good. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.